Mr. Speaker, uh, it's a pleasure to engage in this debate again. What I'm going to speak to is a story of betrayal, of incompetence, of weakness on the part of the Prime Minister, a hubris, recklessness, and it's a story of opportunity lost. Because we didn't have to even engage in this negotiation the way the Prime Minister engaged. Now, our Prime Minister assumed that because Donald Trump has said he was going to tear up NAFTA, that somehow he needed to reach out to President Trump and say, hey, I gladly renegotiate this agreement. Well, anyone who knows anything about the American trade system knows that the President cannot unilaterally tear up a trade agreement. He needs to have the consent and the approval of Congress. Now, think about this. 35 of the American states have Canada as their number one export market. Now, you show me the representatives and the senators and the governors from those states. You think they'll ever agree tearing up the old NAFTA? Of course not. But our Prime Minister marched into this negotiation and said, President Trump, what do you want from us? And that's how it all started. And President Trump said, well, I've got this huge trade deficit with Canada. Uh, fake news. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the truth is that our trade with the United States is virtually perfectly balanced. You know, one month it'll be one way, a couple of billion dollars, another month the other way. But the reality is our trade is as perfectly balanced as any two countries could expect. The President's target was Mexico, right. but somehow our Prime Minister didn't figure that out. So our Prime Minister said he was going to bring back a win-win-win, right? Three wins, one for Mexico, one for the U.S., and one for Canada. So did we get a win out of this no. deal? No. Well, Mr. Speaker, by any reasonable measure and standard, we lost, and we lost big time. Right. Let me explain why. What are the wins? Well, we did get a digital economy chapter out of it because back when NAFTA was first negotiated, we didn't have a digital economy. Today it is ubiquitous, so it made sense to have a chapter for that. Yes, we did synchronize some of our intellectual property rules with the United States. Okay, that's okay. We raised our de minimis amount so people can come across the borders with a higher duty-free limit. But there were no real market access gains for Canada in this agreement. Maybe a little bit of sugar. That's about it, Mr. Speaker, honestly. You know, earlier Liberal speakers, they defined the success. They defined success in this agreement by what Canada hadn't lost. They said, well, we were able to defend this. Chapter 19, we were able to preserve it. Mr. Speaker, what a great win. We preserved what we had before. Well, that's not my definition of a win, Mr. Speaker. My definition of a win is we gain something from the United States, not just security, not simply a marketplace that will not be disrupted because we don't have an agreement. So let me now talk about the concessions we made. Can you imagine five years of negotiations, and at the end of it, our Prime Minister agrees to President Trump's demand that there be a six-year sunset clause. In other words, in six years, either we decide to carry on or the deal falls dead. First time Canada has ever done that, by the way. The aluminum industry in Canada was not provided with the same protection against dumping, primarily from China, that the United States got. So we sold out the aluminum industry. Then there are export caps on the auto industry for parts and for vehicles being exported. We conceded Canadian sovereignty on milk pricing. Never before have we done that. Where well, we said, President Trump, if we want to change our milk pricing regime, we will come to you cap in hand, on bended knee, and beg you for permission to do this, Shame. to defend our uh, supply management system. We did the same thing on sovereignty over trade negotiations. Can you imagine that, Mr. Speaker? We agreed with Donald Trump that if we ever want to negotiate a trade agreement with a non-market economy like China, 
We have to come to him and ask him for permission to do that. Shame. And the Shame. sly fox that he is, Mr. Speaker, you know what he did? He's already negotiated his own deal with China, right. at least a phase one deal, so he doesn't have to come to us, cap in hand. We have to go to him to try to compete on a level playing field with China. Do you think he'll ever approve that? No. Of course not. No. We got snookered, Mr. Speaker. We did. We got snookered. Absolutely. And it gets worse. We conceded double the amount in terms of new dairy access that the Americans will have to our market than our Conservative government had negotiated under the TPP. That's a massive failure. And it gets worse, Mr. Speaker. You know what they did? They actually imposed export caps on our ability to export value-added milk products. For example, in the milk industry, if you're making cheese, there are byproducts, which used to be washed down the drain. But, you know, we had some smart Canadian companies. One of them in Abbotsford, British Columbia, Vitalis. And we had Mr. Vanderpool, Phil Vanderpool, at committee. And we asked him, well, what about the export caps? In other words, the U.S. required us to limit our exports, not only to the United States, which might have been fair, but to limit our exports of these value-added, unique products to other countries all around the world. We said to Donald Trump, you know what? We're not going to be able to export beyond those cap limits. And I asked Mr. Van der Poel at committee, did you get a chance to talk to the minister and the trade representatives about this? And he said, yes, we had a meeting. And they told us in no uncertain terms, export caps are not on the table. And when the agreement came out, guess what? No, it wasn't only on the table. It was negotiated away by our Liberal government. That's the betrayal part of this agreement, Mr. Speaker. Shame. That's a betrayal. And Mr. Vanderpool was very, very upset about how his industry got sold out by this Liberal government. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me then talk about the process that the government undertook to apprise Canadians of what this deal really meant in economic terms. The United States did an economic impact assessment. By the way, it should be, I've got it here, 400 stinking pages of it, <laughs> which explains the impact it will have on their economy. And it's a positive impact. They say they made major gains against Canada. Ours was a 73-pager, Mr. Speaker. And it didn't even compare the old NAFTA to the new NAFTA. He compared a universe without NAFTA at all to the new NAFTA. Terrible. Fortunately, there's an organization in Canada that did the work that this Liberal government failed to do. And that was the C.D. Howe Institute. And they actually compared what is the impact of the new NAFTA when you compare it to what the old NAFTA delivered for Canadians in economic terms. And you know what they concluded, Mr. Speaker? It's a sad story. This is a story of failure on the Liberal part. They concluded that Canada is going to sacrifice about $14 billion of economic activity every single year going forward. $14 billion of GDP hit that we're going to take as a result of this agreement. Is that a responsible agreement? No. No, no. no they used to say, they used to say, well, you know what? It's better no NAFTA than a bad NAFTA, right? That's what these guys used to say. Now they're saying, oh, better a new NAFTA than no NAFTA at all, right? Like, they don't know what they're talking about. They talk about a win-win-win. <laughs> they talk about delivering a better deal for Canadians. And at the end of the day, after we look at this agreement, and I do have some experience in trade, Mr. Speaker. Right. Here, here, here. 51 agreements. This is a big fail. It's a big fail for Canadians. I wish we had better news for Canadians because we can do so much better. The concessions we made in this agreement, the previous Conservative government would have never made. Right. There are things in this deal that Canada has never agreed to before, and yet this Liberal government made those concessions. That's a sad, sad story. It's a story of failure. Good job. Good job.